Are we live? Hi, let us know if we're live. I am Brandon, one of your authors for the evening. I am joined by Jancy. Hello. Uh, this is Jancy Patterson, one of my favorite people ever um, and uh, one of my good writing buddies. Uh, Jancy has stopped by to keep us company tonight and chat about various sundry things. How is your day going, Jancy? My day is good. Yeah? I just finished some last minute fixes on Evershore and turned it in. So Yay! <laughs> it's in. I'm happy about that. Those That went fast. Yeah. yeah. You did tell me it would be fast. Right. Yeah. People but, freak out. They're like, oh, we yeah. have a deadline. And I'm like, I did the whole revision in four days. Yes. <laughs> It'll <Yeah>. be fine. <laughs> yeah. This happens. Editors do this a lot. Yeah. I have noticed um, yeah. that, that they panic a little bit more than the authors do on some things. We panic yeah, on think, other things. Yeah, I know that's true. Um, I, uh, what have I panicked the most on? <laughs> um, I pan, oh, the, this one was my fault. The most panicky moment in my entire publishing career was when I got to the airport to fly to the UK for uh, Fantasy Con in the UK. My publisher was bringing me out and I had PM written down and the plane left in AM. Oh, no. So it's been like 12 hours? It's been like 12 <gasps> hours, oh, no. right? And the timing was kind of tight anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was a bit of a panic moment. Yeah. Did it, it worked out, I guess. It did. And I then it's in the past. <laughs> on another flight. Um, I had uh, been in business class, and I think I just got in whatever seat. Yeah, they for me sure. In. Um, and so normally um, I get those business class seats that I can lay down in and sleep for an overnight nap. It is a luxury, I know, but what it really helps me hit the ground running. Yeah. Didn't have this this time. Got there, arrived just in time to get on the uh, the van that they were driving from London to Manchester, I think, to have the thing. And so I was without sleep forever, oh, and wow. I'm on this bus with a bunch of other authors. It's not a bus. It's like a big right. uh, conversion van or something. But they're like, we're going to go on a, a party bus, a van together. All. And, so <laughs> and you're like, quiet, I need to sleep. Yes, and they're all super cool, great people. But I'm like, I <laughs> hate everything and everyone right now. And it was traffic through London. And uh, then we got that. It, it was it was a miserable 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, I Followed bet. by a delightful convention uh, full of people who were wonderful. I think it might have been Galans Fest rather than Fantasy Con. But Is that anyway. how you say it? Galans? I think that's how you say it. Galans. I don't. I, I always say the UK publisher because yes. I can't say it or spell it. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if I'm on the internet or in person. <laughs> <laughs> the UK publisher is doing that. What's uh? What's have you had any panicky moments in your writing? Career? Oh my gosh, so many! I feel mm. like it's just one solid panic all the time. It you, is kind of moving from from high anxiety moment to high anxiety moment, being in entertainment, right? Yeah, here's a good one. So we, um, Isaac Stewart made a beautiful map for me for my Five Land saga. It's uh -huh. so pretty and I love it so much. And it was a favor that Isaac did for me, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so things on the map don't change. That's the background because I would never ask Isaac to touch that again. So the map is the continuity. And if the book says something else, the book changes, yeah. right? Right. So we get all the way to galleys on, I think it was Oathbreaker, which is the second book in the mm -hmm. in the trilogy and we discover we've got these characters walking from point a to point b and there's a giant river we are in the galleys and like crossing a giant river and like medieval technology is a yeah. big deal and like we're looking at the map and we're looking at the book and we're like well the river doesn't move so what are we gonna do and we exposited the river is what we did but we felt real stupid that we didn't look at our own map when the characters were traveling i do that too often. Yeah. That's the thing I get the most trouble in is scale and movement. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm like, I just need people to go from here to here. And they're like, you can't get people from there to there. Right. Um, and, you know, in early in my career, before I had people to tell me that, I just wrote it. And yeah. now it's nice to have beta readers and continuity editors mm -hmm. and people who are like, you know, we measured the distance and maybe we should do something different in the story um, because... You know, they would have to have a supersonic jet in order to, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I read those books with Megan Walker, and Megan is, like, our detail person. She's really good at measuring the distances and stuff. And so you would think that, like, mm -hmm. knowing that she's going to have to do that, either of us would think about these things. But instead, we're just like, and they all arrived at the same time. They traveled <laughs> m many different distances and started at many different times. And they all happen to show up in the scene, and it's real important that they're all there at the same time. And then we get to the continuity edit, and we're like, oh. <laughs> 
Um, I actually don't mind changing the book to match the art um, uh, in little ways. Like uh, when I was doing Elantris, I got this really gorgeous cover. I love the Elantris cover mm -hmm. um, from Stéphane Martinier, who's, uh, who hadn't done a lot of book covers at that point. So I was one of the first. He was a concept artist and um, things like that. And it, had, it depicts the scene that never occurs in the book. And I've since realized that doesn't matter, right? The most movie poster scenes do not happen right. in the movie. It's, it's marketing. It's, it's marketing. It's a poster for your book. But I'm like, you know, I could write this scene in. It'd take me like one page. And then in an edit, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to write the scene in. So <laughs> Nice. So that it matches the, the cover. And I've been pleased having done that ever since. That's so. awesome. Uh, so we will be taking questions, by the way, guys. Um, we are here kind of to support and publicize Sunreach being out, uh, which is the first of the novellas um, that Jancy and I wrote together, secretly an actual novel. But we're calling yeah. it novella vella to not be as intimidating to people because it is novel length. Yeah, it's we call, I wrote Bastille. We yeah. co-authored that one. And that's, we call that one a novel, a novel, but it's shorter, it's shorter <laughs> than yeah. Sunreach. It's kind of funny. Yes. Um, but um, we are just going to be talking about all various things that will not be spoilers for um, there will not be major spoilers for Sunreach or things, though we would love to have questions um, for both of us and Jancy about a number of things. Um, like if you are curious about indie publishing, Jancy is really good at indie publishing. She knows her stuff. Mm -hmm. She does it a lot. <laughs> she knows it way better than I do. Um, if you're curious about co-authoring, Jancy is an expert at co-authoring. Yes. Uh, and uh, I might have a question for you in a second to get us kicked off. Awesome. Um, if you just have questions for us about writing in general, it's totally fine. Uh, you know, whatever the two of us can talk about. Uh, we met in college. Uh, we've been good friends. Like, um, like I met Jancy at about the same time I met Isaac. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, uh, throw stuff at us. Throw questions at, uh, at Jancy about her own work if you happen to have read it. And if you haven't, you should go read it. Um, well, Jancy, what should they read? Sinking City. Sinking City. Yeah. That's the one I recommend to people coming yes, that's from. That's a good book. I've read that one. <laughs> yes. Um, you cover quoted it. I did so cover quote have. that book, and it was really good. But it's a like Venetian magical mafia adventure. So mm -hmm. it's I think the closest of my work to like the Skyward universe, sort of YA adventure yeah. stuff. So. And you are a fantastic writer. I want to hear you. We we've talked about on stream before. No, we talked about on writing excuses about the the dollhouse. The dolls. The dolls. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about the dolls on this, just in case people haven't listened to that episode. So um, my friend and co-writer, Megan Walker, and I, we write a bunch of different series together. She is also a co-author co on Sinking City. Um, but we do what we call Barbie pre-writing. So we have dolls for all of our characters, um, mostly Barbie dolls. We do some other 12-inch dolls as well. And Megan's basement is full of a bunch of Barbie dioramas that we build for fun. And then we put the dolls in the dioramas and we role play out the scenes. It's a lot like D&D, &D, but without the rules, right? We just mm -hmm. sit down and start talking. Um, and sometimes we'll pause the scene and be like, what do you think about where this is going? Maybe we should try this direction. You're moving the dolls, right? You're having uh, we only move them okay. like into proximity with each other. Okay. We don't hold on to them and like act it out with okay. them. So you sit them down. You're like, they're going to have It's a like a visual aid. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Um, it helps a lot, actually. It's really hard to do without the dolls for mm. us anyway. Um, but we, we set it up and yeah, then if someone moves somewhere else in the room, yeah. we'll pick up the doll and move them elsewhere, but we don't move them other than that. And do you video this so that mm -hmm. when you're writing, you have it or no? No, when we're being good, we stop after the scene and we take notes. Okay. When we're not, we'll do a whole book and then try to remember what we did. And that's always super fun. And we hate ourselves. Uh, that's it. Cause I was kind of imagining the action scenes of actually making a Barbie kick the other Barbie or <laughs> that would like be that. awesome. But, but you don't actually, we don't do, do a lot of action either. Like we mostly do the dialogue. What we get out of it is the character voices the mm -hmm. relationships right um those sorts of things well and one of the tools to make your writing better that a lot of people mention is to speak the lines out loud to someone mm -hmm. right yeah or do almost a table read yeah. sort of thing it's one of the the big pieces of advice that gets given a lot and is really good advice right if you're pretty if you're having trouble with dialogue if you're having trouble with motivations in dialogue treating it like a conversation so you're getting that done one of the things it helps us with, especially in our rom-coms, uh, we have a, ro a romantic comedy series called The Extra. And 
it helps us to avoid some of the dumb tropes of like people don't talk to each other because right. like we'll outline that and be like this is what it's going to be and this is the conflict of the book and then we get the characters in the scene and when you're having a conversation they just talk and then mm-hmm. they say the thing they say and the then thing, yeah. we're like what are we going to do now and it makes us come up with a plot that isn't based on them not saying the thing right. occasionally there's something they're really motivated not to say and that's okay but mm-hmm. things that they would just say they just say and then we're like crap that was our plot what are we going to do yeah the famous uh term for that um i th- I think I don't think Scott Meredith coined it. Scott Meredith was Joshua, one of my right. agent's mentors. Um, but it's called idiot plotting. I yeah. think you just referenced it. It's when yeah. your story wouldn't happen if people a- didn't act like idiots, right? And sometimes like it's okay for them not yeah. to talk to each other. People tend to turn that into like if the characters just talk to each other and it would be solved, that's a bad plot. But it's right. if they're motivated to talk to each other and they and talk they to don't. each other. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. No. People, people in real life don't talk all the time. All the time. Yeah. People con- con- uh, have conflicts all the time. Yeah. That's not idiot plotting. Idiot plotting right. is this character would absolutely sit down and tell right. you know, this character, as we've established her, would talk to her parents about mm-hmm. this situation. Right. Then she's just not going to. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Let's take uh, some questions. What do we What do we got? Well, first of all, I just have to say that one of my favorite comments so far, talking about the Barbie stuff, is people referencing Dark Helmet or yeah, Dark Helmet from Spaceballs. Yes, playing with his dolls. I've seen it. Oh, so, in Spaceballs, <laughs> the the yeah. the joke is that like the the characters are merchandised in world. Okay. That's it's it's a goofy Mel Brooks thing. You can bring the waters around. Thank you. Uh, you might have to be on screen. Thank you. Hello, Hazel. I think that's Hazel behind the mask. Um, um, And so there's a scene where the Darth Vader character, who's played by Rick Moranis, so it's not a very serious Darth Vader character, has the dolls of all the characters and is play acting. That's awesome. The movie, the way he would want it to go. Um, And Rick Moranis is a gem. And so it's a a really great uh, little scene. Nice. (laughs) Anyway, so the first question is from Cheyenne L. Sheridan. Uh, Question for Jancy. Was the novel length, quote unquote, novella Brandon's influence, or is that something you're (laughs) prone to as well? So um, I don't write short. And I was originally asked to write 30,000 word novellas, Mm -hmm. and I was like, "Hmm, we'll see. (laughs) I do have a couple of novellas in my romance series that are shorter, that are more closer to 30,000 words. And so I told myself the way I get 30,000 words, I limit myself to 12 chapters. Mm -hmm. Um, So if it's 12 chapters long, it'll be about 30,000 words. And then Brandon and I, like we were kicking outlines back and forth. And like when we finished, I think, I think I said said this in an email, I sent this email and I was like, so this is not a 30,000 word novella. This is a 50,000 word novella and you can't complain. I can't. (laughs) I really have no grounds to stand on. I thought uh, the thing is, a novella technically starts at 17,000 words Mm -hmm. and goes to around 40, right? right? Uh, That's kind of the, the, there are loose definitions or whatnot. Um, And so already 30,000 was like a long novella. Mm -hmm. But I mean, (laughs) my novellas, uh, I mean, Don Shard is that length as well, right? Right. Like we are primarily novelists. Yeah. Um, We think in novel terms. Mm -hmm. And when I write a novella, I write a short novel. It's just a novel with a single viewpoint and maybe a little more focused. Um, yeah. That's what Emperor's Soul is. That's what Dawn Shard is. That's um, what these are. And that's what these are. Yeah. Um, and I have tried writing short stories. I'm much worse at it, but I have done some I'm of them. Not, uh, but a novella, I still want to tell a character's full, complete story. Yeah. Right? Like, well, and I, the comments that I get on these the most is, I wanted more of this, I wanted more of that. Yes. And I'm like, me too. I was already twice the length I was supposed to be. Yes. Like, I couldn't do everything, but there was just so much that I did want to do because mm-hmm. the characters are so fun and so rich and I wanted and to play with them. You did such a good job. <laughs> Thank these, you. These stories are amazing. <laughs> you guys, yeah, um, it's, it's been really fun. I had um, fun with it. So what else, what else we got? Uh, before any you any move Barbie on, doll questions? Yeah, but- <laughs> Before we move on, I've seen a couple people uh, mention that it feels a little quiet. Can, if you guys can just let me know in the chat if it's quiet. Oh, or yeah. Loud. Okay. I want to make sure everyone can be heard. Everyone so, yell at Adam. Yes, that's <laughs> it's definitely my fault. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, only because Kellen's, you know, not close enough to blame. <laughs> okay, so uh, Joey Ranker says, when collaborating, collaborating, to what extent do you adapt to each other's writing style? And is that difficult? Let me ask you uh, further on this. Um, there are lots of different types of collaboration. And everybody, I collaborate with several different people, uh-huh. and everyone I collaborate with, it's completely different. Um, so 
let why don't you just talk about like the different styles? Like our collaborations are using what I call the Bain model. Um, the Bain model is uh, um, one author develops the world and together you come up with an outline. W another author does all the writing and then another author does a pass. Um, okay. And this is this is basically the Bain. They like usually they've did a lot of them with Anne McCaffrey. They mm -hmm. do a lot of them with Eric Flint. They do a lot of them with David Weber. Uh, this style. Um, that's one of the main models I've heard of. Though this is also the model that Dragonlance was written under. If oh. you've read Dragonlance, yeah. um, that Tracy Hickman didn't write any of the prose. He was there for the did the world building and things like that. Mm -hmm. And Margaret Weiss did the writing. I believe I could be wrong on that. If uh, if I if I'm wrong, let me know. Um, but there's also the um, alternating chapters method. Mm -hmm. There's also the just write whatever you feel is great at the moment and then mix them together. Like, how has it been for your different collaborations? So I've done a lot of different things. First person I ever collaborated with was James Goldberg. Um, and we wrote a book that actually just came out because it took us a real long time to write it. Um, it's called The Bollywood Lovers Club. And with James, we we sort of did the alternating chapters things. There's two viewpoints. So people think I wrote one and James wrote the other, but that's not what we did. We outlined it together. We went through the outline a whole bunch until we had it where we wanted it. And then we would just look at what's coming up and say, which one do you want? Right. And we'd each claim one and we'd each write one. Um, and then we'd come back and sort of like go through it again. Um, when I've heard Neil Gaiman or Terry Pratchett talk about writing good omens, they talk that way. Yeah. And that's what Megan and I do too. Mm -hmm. um, the difference between what James and I did and what Megan and I do is uh, Megan and I blast through a draft and we'll just do the whole thing. James and I did a lot more like, let's stop. This isn't working. Let's go back and revise. And it took us a long time, um, mm -hmm. but it's a really good book and I'm really proud of it. Um, but that was, it's more literary fiction. And with right. literary fiction, it's a little bit harder to just jam through something. You kind of yeah. have to have everything working or it's not working at all. Um, whereas something plot driven, yeah. you can sort of jam through something and then fix it, um, which is what Megan and I do. And then uh, with Megan, I do what we call the content pass, mm -hmm. which is like, I love my favorite part of writing is to take a draft that is broken and take the big chunks and move them all around. Uh -oh. And like the big macro revision. Um, uh Oh, we're hearing, we're hearing, we, you I can hear, hear myself. Hear I don't want to hear myself. And, and guess who's to blame? <laughs> Is it actually Kellen this time? Wow. Yeah. It's rare that we saying? blame some Kellen for something that's actually her fault. So then Megan does a content pass where she messes with all the details, which I hate. I hate the details. This mm. is like all the, the continuity and the little pieces and all the little things that are out of place. And then we both do a galley pass at the very end. Okay. Um, so that's... And yeah. yeah. And so, but I also, you were talking about the different worlds. I've actually never collaborated with someone in a world that I came up with because oh, right. I hate ideas. I'm uh. not an idea person. I don't like them. I don't like having to come up with things. I really like working in other people's settings. Do you? So that's what yeah. I do. Yeah. I love, I love, <laughs> if you can't tell, I love, I love outlining and coming up with settings and mm -hmm. things. It is one of my favorite things to do. Um, in fact, I've talked, I've lamented before that one of the things I don't get to do as much as I used to um, is just write random novels mm -hmm. that are not in a setting that I've done before or things like that. Like, I, I do want, like, I want to have big masterpieces like the Stormlight Archive that I've done. I want to have done that. Right. But my, like, natural inclination is, let's go write this other thing. Woo! Right. So I have to, like, have this push and pull to get myself to do the things that I know will be more fulfilling that I yeah. want to have done, um, that I'm not always having writing ADHD and zipping off into other directions. But it it is kind of this push and pull in my career. That, I feel like, is the pull, push and pull of creativity. Like yeah. People talk about, like, a writer's block and getting, like, bogged down in things. But I feel like really what it's about is understanding what puts energy in to your, like, process and what takes energy out. And you have yeah. to do the things that take the energy out. But when the balance gets off... It gets yeah. real bad yeah. <laughs> real is, fast. Is that like your – because we get the – I assume you get the writer's block question a ton. Mm -hmm. Is that what you say to people is find out what gives you the energy? Or? I think I've said a lot of different things, but that's, mm -hmm. I feel like, what I would say now for sure. And for me, what gives me the energy is other people to work with. Uh -huh. and like social interaction. I mm -hmm. would not, this is something that like, I think has always been true of me, but I've only figured it out really in the last few years that like when I am stuck in a room by myself, I get real just bogged down in it. And mm -hmm. if I have somebody to bounce it off of, 
it goes so much better and faster and I'm much happier. And so that's what I do now. People, a lot of people have asked me, um, with Sunreach coming out, like, what should I, how should I check out your solo stuff? And I'm like, okay. well, you can mm-hmm. check out my other stuff. <laughs> I do have some solo books that I did before, but like, really. I still really love Thousand Faces. Um, I would recommend that to anyone. I th- thought it was an excellent, I think it is an <laughs> excellent novel. Um, that's a good one coming from, from Skyward too. Yeah, it's a good one. It's, it's, YA a, it's, it's a YA thriller. Yeah, yeah it's um, like a spy thriller about people yeah. who change their faces. Yep. It was fun. It, um, it's a really good book. Um, but, you know, you had that experience that in New York, I don't know how much you mm. want to talk about it. I can talk about it. Where it's like, you're like, oh, I got the dream. I got picked uh, up by a publisher. Oh, everything went poorly. Yeah, uh, things went real bad. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, this is where, this is not every indie author, but there's a significant number of indie authors who are like, wow, the dream in New York is not as pretty as I thought it was. But then a lot of indie authors go the other way and they feel like New York has nothing to offer them. Mm. And I feel like the way I put it is like, it's, I'm a little bit opportunist about it. Like to me, indie, indie publishing and New York, it's like a train, right? And I'm going to get on whatever train is going in the direction I want to go. And so for a while that was to put out books by myself, which I'm still Mm -hmm. doing. Sometimes it's to work with a publisher, which we're doing now with Sunreach. And to me, it doesn't really matter. No one sits around and is like, well, I'm not going to take that train. Right. Like where people get real, they get real opinionated about which method of publishing is superior right. when really they're all just tools to make a living writing books which is the goal i have said that hybrid uh, authorship is the place to be most um, successful people that i yeah. know are hybrid and you know i am hybrid it's just that mm-hmm. i um i don't really count in a lot of ways indie author wise in that i already had a name i had built yeah. with new york that i can leverage for my indie authorship sure. so i don't have to do the hard part of being an indie author, yeah. right? You're, you have some gaps for yeah. sure, but you're still hybrid. I am still hybrid. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, a lot of our um, a lot of our things are hybrid. Our leather mm-hmm. bounds are. Yeah. Um, the two previous mainframe projects I did were were done indie author, mm-hmm. but this one we're partnering with Random House. So, right. Yeah. Uh, what what else you got for us, uh, Adam? So loose there in telescope. Ah, sorry, my old I need friend. To turn myself up a little bit. Uh, question for both. Uh, both of you have, co- have co-written before with various co-other authors. Man, if I could read. But from the sound of it, uh, the sound of it processes vary a lot by person. How did the process for Skyward Flight compare to your other experiences? So for me, it was the easiest of all of them. <laughs> um, I just, Jan C's writing and mine just vibe well together. Also, we like get each other on a plot level yes. like our mm-hmm. conversations i need to start recording them because they go a mile a minute because brandon's like yeah. how about this and i'm like yeah that how about this oh yeah, yeah. that and we yeah. just get through everything like super fast yeah it's like we, we fix problems we problem solve very yeah. easily um like so it, it's interesting i've done three different ones uh i guess four i've collaborated on four different properties the first was the wheel of time which is mm-hmm. a very strange experience. Yeah, no doubt. Um, and then the second two were their mainframe pro- uh, projects. One was with Mary Robinette, mm-hmm. one with, with Stephen Bowles. Um, and the, the big difference on this one was that, uh, um, like, I don't, I don't have to tell you how to do something. I used to be like, what about this? And you're like, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. That, that works. Or no, that doesn't work. What about, and I'm like, what about this? You're like, oh, that fixes it. Okay. And from my side, it's great because I don't have to come up with ideas. I can just be like, Brandon, I need an idea. There was one point Mm -hmm. um, for, I won't spoil anything, but for the end of Sunreach, one of the things about space battles, it's really hard to make them interesting because what do we do? We fly and we shoot. We don't do anything, but we fly Mm -hmm. and we shoot. And I I got to the end and I was like- You texted me on that. I did. I need a cool idea. I was like, give me a cool idea. And he gave me three cool ideas. I used one of them and I saved the other two. Yep. So now I have ideas. It's Mm -hmm. fantastic. Yep. What, uh, what from your perspective for that question, anything else you wanted to add? Um, you don't have to. I just want to make sure I didn't. Oh, there was yeah. one thing about the, I think this was actually the last question, but we we're talking about matching styles. Mm-hmm. Um, we talk about like every writer, it's true of everybody, gets a few things for free that you don't have to work on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so people ask me a lot about like, how do I make it sound just like Megan wrote it or just mm-hmm. like Brandon wrote it? And I don't know the answer and I wish I did, but I get that question all the time. And I think it's because that's just one of my free things. Like yeah. I got dialogue in that. It wasn't plot. <laughs> it wasn't structure. It wasn't a lot of things I wish I did naturally. But You can that attest one. to this. I read Sunreach and I'm like, 
Jancy, <laughs> it reads just like my characters. How do you do this? Yeah, right? I don't know. That took a ton of work for me on Wheel of Time. Yeah. Um, that was the biggest, like, I don't think I got that one for free, right? Yeah. Um, it took a lot of work to be able to, in no one is ever going to match stylistically exactly. No. And yours is pretty close, but the character voice is the important part. The yeah. characters sound like themselves. Um, and, you know, one of the things we're doing with these novellas is I don't have time in the mainline books to devote to developing these characters, right? The mainline books are about Spencer and to a lesser, lesser extent, some, some few of the characters like Jordan. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I don't really have time to, re to dig in there. 100,000 word YA action adventure They're already books. big. They're already, yeah. And so one of the goals with this is to be like, basically, Jancy, FM is yours now, right? Um, like, let's make her a real character rather than just the little bits that I can give in the novel. And it was really fulfilling for me to just basically turn over one of my children and be like, raise this child, right? <laughs> uh, FM, and then have you come back and be like, what about this? What about this? What about this? Mm -hmm. um, and then just kind of like, you know, I consider like, uh, she'll still be in, you know, the books I'm working on yeah. things, but I consider her now Jancy's character that is playing a role in the stuff I'm writing because she's now so vivid and alive. Um, and that is just, that has been really satisfying for me as an author because I don't know if it is this way for you, but you, as an author, you have to make all these decisions and some mm -hmm. of your children you have to ignore. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And you can't tell all the stories. And uh, you can't. And in every book, you're like, all right, this is a child that, that, that I'm ignoring. This is an orphan. This is an orphan. This is an orphan because I can do this. And in this series now, some of my children are no longer orphans. I thought it was really fun too. Um, Jorgen wasn't on my original list yeah. of characters because mm -hmm. I was given this list of basically people I could do anything with. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And he's not one of those. Nope. But I thought it was really fun. Like, yeah, we're getting to... much more kind of collaborating on yeah. Jorgen um, and things like that. So and there that's going to be fun. There were some things, <clears throat> spoiler free, of course, but there were some things you wanted to do with him that were not what I would have done. Yes. But like figuring out how to make that work and digging in was really fun for mm -hmm. me. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah, I threw I threw a curveball at you, definitely. Um, with what <laughs> you, you you will find out this curveball at the end of Cytonic, um, and um, and or in the novellas, which ones you ever end up reading first? Yeah, we have said before the reading order that we intend is Sunreach, Read On, which are the first two of the novellas, then Cytonic, then Evershore. However, you're not going to, it's not going to be a disaster if you read all three novellas and then Cytonic, or if you read Cytonic, then all three novellas. I assume when it's out in print, because we're yeah. going to do a collection of all three, mm -hmm. that we won't get many people stopping between. Yeah, yeah I, I assume the collection. People will do one or the other. Yeah, it would be assume. read right before Cytonic would be my guess. But or right after or would right be after. okay too. Yeah. Either one would be fine. So, Adam, what you got for us? So, uh, here's a question uh, just for you, Brandon, from uh, the mm -hmm. Reddit post I had. Uh, and I'm assuming it's going to be, I don't know, or mm. wrap up. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, would you mind giving us one tidbit that we don't know about the Pure Lake? I want to know more about it. And that's from 90, Reddit or 90. I appreciate this question, but I try to, uh, the, you asked it the right way. You asked about something specific. Um, I try not to do too much of this because if I get answered too many questions like this, like I'm going to fill up all sorts of factoids that <laughs> I won't even be able to keep track of, right? right. Um, and so, um, but um, it was, do you know this? It was originally called the Everlake. Oh. And then I just didn't like that for some reason. I decided uh, to, to pull back because I'm like, well, eh, it's not that big. It's really shallow. That's the cool thing about it. But, um, and so that's kind of fun now having a book with Ever in the title in Evershore mm -hmm. um, that I didn't name, name it the Pure Lake that. Um, and there is this, yeah, so I'll just leave it there. I don't think I've heard that before. So yeah. It seems like that. it's uh, pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, Udi Kumra says, question for Jancy. How did you go about adding depth and complexity to FM's character to turn her from a supporting character in Skyward to a main POV, POV character in Sunreach? So what I did with her, I started with everything and I knew. So I read through Skyward and I made notes of everything. Um, which I really, I, I 
did myself a disservice because I took all of my notes. I read all the way through. And then we decided to write about all Anique and I had to do it again because <laughs> <laughs> right. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know I was writing about her the first time through. Um, but I, so I started with all of my notes and then I went um, to Brandon with some questions about things like, where does her call sign come from? Things like that. Um, and then I took that information and that was the basis. I, when I say like, I'm not an idea person, what I really mean is my, I don't do spontaneous idea, idea generation out of nowhere. I prefer to have something to start with. And so I took what I knew and then what, what about that could I make interesting in a like fully fleshed out character? And then also looked at the plot that we were looking, like we had some ideas about what, where we were going to go with the story. And so what could I do within the realm of what I had for her that would interact interestingly with that? And I struggled with her. Um, because, and this, this is not a spoiler, um, Mm -hmm. she is not empowered by the military structure. Jorgen is empowered. FM Mm -hmm. is not. Um, and so there were several times, I don't know if I've told you this, there were several times, I think I may have even drafted the email of, I give up. I'm just going to do all three from Jorgen's perspective. I can't do this. Um, and every time there were some things that I really wanted to do with her. Um, it's the subplot that if you've read the book, you know what one, mm-hmm. one, one it is. And I was really attached to that. And I kept being like, no, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. Um, and eventually I figured out within the scenes how to make her sort of drive the action without actually being able to make the call. I think um, there are two main subplots, and I'm not going to mention them for spoiler reasons mm-hmm. that, with her, that I think are both things that you could do that I don't think I could have done, at least not as well, with her character, which is where we're, when you do a collaboration, that's at least exciting for me, right? Yeah. Like the like specific things with FM, it's like a story that Jancy could tell better than I could uh, with this character, and that that makes me happy. That's totally what's exciting about collaboration mm-hmm. for me. Yeah. I won't, no spoilers, but the end of uh, Read On is something mm-hmm. I never in a million years would have come up with or done. But it was super fun to write a story that I would never in a million years have come up with or done. It was really different um, and really fun. So what so, do we got? Yeah, Evelyn Basham says, oh, another question is for Jancy. Uh, if you could start over again as a debut writer, Ooh. would you focus on traditional publishing or self-publishing? Oh, that's real hard. Probably a loaded question right there. That's real hard. So if I was starting over again when I started... Indie publishing was not as, um, what's the word? It wasn't viable. Viable. Yeah. That's the word I was looking for. I wanted to say valid, but it wasn't. It was not viable when I started. Um, so I didn't really have a choice. Um, but if I were starting now, I think, honestly, I would do what I'm currently doing now, which is try to get an agent and do both. Um, I have an agent. He is amazing. And he still sends out my projects in New York. We try to always get our first books done a couple of years before we want to publish them so that he can take them and shop them around. Um, and then we'll do all, we don't send him our sequels. We just go from there with the series if it doesn't sell. Um, and I think that's a really good model. It's a slow model, but basically everything in publishing is real slow. So that's... That's very similar to the advice that I give people just um, without quite as much awareness um, and you guys have heard this one before, so I won't go into depth. But the idea that, um, number one, I would decide based on what you just, you like to write. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's if a big one. If you want to write um, a big, in-depth, historical fiction that you're only going to be writing one every five years, indie publishing is just not as well served for you. It's real hard to make any money if you don't have at least three books in a series. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And even just three in a series is rough. Indie publishing, it's really hard. Well, and you did the thing, was it one a month that you released yeah, uh, extra? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah we did like, one a month for about six months, almost six yeah. months. Uh, and now we do one every three months as we continue the series. And that's really common in indie publishing, I've noticed. Yeah, it's necessary Yeah. Um, because they're, on Amazon, we have what's called the 90-day cliff, which is the algorithm pays more attention to things that just came out. But when, at least, I mean... It's hard to say what the algorithm does because it's yeah. proprietary and we don't exactly know. But it appears that when you put out a new book in a series, the whole series gets to start over in that 90 days. And so we see a huge drop off in sales if we don't put out a book every 90 days. Yeah. And if that terrifies you, 
indie publishing is not a good place for you. Right. If that excites you, yeah. then indie play- publishing is a great place for yeah. you. Yeah. There's also like expectations. Like I uh, indie published a bunch of books that were not a great fit for indie publishing, but I'm mm-hmm. glad I did it. I have a bunch of uh, contemporary young adult books. They don't do great, but I had written them to try to sell in New York. They didn't sell in New York. The alternative is they'd be on my hard drive, right? right? Like there's nothing wrong with putting out projects that are not perfectly tailored to the market. Um, you just have to have expectations about what's going to happen. You're probably yeah. not going to make a million dollars on it. That's a really good point. Um, and you probably won't. You probably won't make a million on anything. But if you are different, sometimes those are the things that take off, right? Sometimes. Um, like I, I look back at Lemony Snicket. I'm like, <laughs> why did Lemony Snicket take off? Right. Like I love Lemony Snicket, but I'm like, I can't believe that, that people love these mm-hmm. because they are so weird. Yeah. And I have a feeling that it's like publishing is like, this isn't like anything else we're publishing. Why would we publish that? But somebody took a chance on it. Um, and so who knows, who knows, but probably, probably not, but there's all, there's room for lots of space between the, I write a book every five years and I write a book every three months. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Matteo Folletti says, Brandon, Hmm. do you have any plans of co of writing co-authored stories for the Cosmere? They would love that. So, um, basically my co-authorship slate is full. Right now, um, I found about where I can handle it. And it's about uh, three people. Right now, it's Stephen Bulls, uh, Jancy, and the Dan Wells projects we're working mm-hmm. on. That's about all I can handle, um, That where I can get back to people in a reasonable time and things like that. Um, that said, I have left one asterisk on there. Um, well, I guess I'm going to put two asterisks, two different separate asterisks. Number one is that if this is success- successful and people like it, then probably – there's a reason I'm trying this out that I started with uh, the first one I did was not connected to any of my worlds at all. That was, um, that was the original with, uh, with Mary Robinette. Mm-hmm. Um, and then eased into picking up a series that I was planning um, just not to be able to get back to, to finally easing into one I'm actively working on. Um, and I kind of eased into that just to see what people are enjoying. And they seem to be enjoying the active working on one the most of all of those, um, which is a plus for doing Cosmere related things. Um, but again, it's going to kind of be, do people like this? The other asterisk is, I have told Isaac Stewart, our mutual friend who did the, the thing for you, he is also a writer. He is also my art director and the man who introduced me to my wife. So Isaac is, uh, is, is a man of many talents and Isaac a wonderful person. And I have told Isaac he is welcome to write in the Cosmere anything he would like to. Um, and I will co-author it with him. I will work on it to make sure. Because Isaac was there from almost the beginning, right? Uh, Peter was the person who was working with me before um, the Cosmere was released. But I, you know, met Isaac and Jancy in 2004 yeah. or something like that. Um, like before Elantris was even out, Yeah, you'd I sold think. it, but it wasn't published yeah. yet. Um, and Isaac started working with me on Mistborn Art right then in 2004. I remember so, sitting with him in yeah. like an institute class and he yeah. was doodling the symbols. That... We, we were at dinner when he drew on the table. You yeah, yeah, that? yeah, that's right. We were at dinner. Isaac draws on the table and I'm like, hey, you're an artist. He's like, yep, because we just met as <laughs> yeah. writers. And I'm like, you want to do a map for me? And he's like, uh, <laughs> sure. He tells that story in kind of fun I've ways. I've forgotten but, that part. Yeah, uh, it was at the... Uh, what. Italian restaurant where the people write on the tables, right? Where they have the crown, macaroni grill, right? Yeah. And he was he was doodling, doodling on the table. But anyway, I've told Isaac he can do whatever he wants. He's got a blank so, slate uh, to be involved in the Cosmere in any way he would like. There's one he's had kicking around for a long time, but I really hope he writes yes. some time. Yeah, he's got he's and so um, we're trying to find time for him yeah. to be able to do that. Uh, he art director stuff is so busy. And so we're trying to we're trying to squeeze in some time, um, maybe take some of those art duties and uh, mm-hmm. get him um, another assistant. The problem is we always we hire him like we hired uh, Ben McSweeney, who's a contractor. He's not an employee, but he does full time for us as right. a contractor. Um, and now we just keep him busy with art. But Isaac is now like managing him as well as right. doing all the stuff he used to do. So. But yeah, so I would say that there's a good chance you get some Cosmere stuff in the future, but it's not near future. Near future, I want to make sure that I'm supporting the things that I'm doing. It would be very easy 
I think, to go all James Patterson, where it's like, woof. And then suddenly I'm not writing anymore. I'm only um, uh, doing this. And I don't think I would enjoy that. Yeah. Um, that's not a dig against James Patterson. People like to like to pile on James Patterson. And everyone I know who's worked with him just really enjoyed the process. I, heard, so. I think it's him who said the, like, there's the thousands of people who don't like my books. Thankfully, yes. there's millions who do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I definitely not a dig against Patterson, but I don't want to go that direction. Yeah. So. Um, well, yeah. So. Somebody's got to finish Stormlight. Someone's got to finish Stormlight, and then well, yeah. Well, I mean, you text Isaac that you said that he could pick any Cosmere book, and he yeah. said Stormlight Five. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> any any world. I think the exact allowed. quote was, "He can write anything he wants in the Cosmere." In the Cosmere. Not, he can write in a world. <laughs> I think Kara's right that Isaac would not want that. Oh no. man, that would kill Isaac. Yeah, Isaac Poor would Isaac. die. Oh, no. man. Isaac has enough anxiety and stress. <laughs> um, so Isaac is amazing. Yes. He did yeah. the art direction on the Sunreach and read on the covers, and he did such a good job. He did a fantastic job. Though, uh, though uh, good old Brian McClellan's still kind of on the list. Um, I've, I, I, I haven't asked his permission. I've just told him I've done this, that if I were to hit by, get hit by a train, his, his job would be to finish Stormlight 5. Oh, so. my gosh. Uh, so poor Brian. Um, he's going to get on the train with you. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's the one that I would say I would have uh, – yeah, he Brian. would obviously have volition in choosing that, but <laughs> he's the one that I have uh, uh, on the list right now. Uh, so, anyway. Uh, Derman, there's not enough. Anyway, uh, for Jancy, how does indie publishing work for an author writing in English but living in a non-English-speaking country? I don't know if you can answer this one. I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, so here's... For all your indie questions, since I can't cover them all, there's a Facebook group on um, on Facebook, obviously. It's called 20 Books, the number 20 Books to 40K, 40K. Um, and you need, if you are want to be in indie publishing, you should be in that group. And then they have, they used to be called Units on Facebook. I'm not sure what they're calling them now, but it's like in the media tab or something. Go on there and you will find they have archived the threads of the wisdom of, I think it's up to like, there's like 50,000 people now on that in that group and they've archived all of the questions and I am sure they cover that there. And so anybody who's in indie publishing, you need to go get in that group and then read their rules, please. Don't go just mm. publish random things and then you can read all of the wisdom of all of that. It's fantastic. It's the best resource. Can I ask you a, a question? Um, this is just a, a pet theory of mine and I'd like to see if it passes the smell test with uh, someone who knows more about indie publishing. One of my pet theories currently is that um, I've seen a lot of people, um, Alexa Dunn, she's a great YouTuber about uh, YA specifically thrillers, talking about the death of the midlist, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and this is, I see a lot of people, and Alexa is focused on traditional publishing. Um, and I see just a lot of people in publishing talking about the death of the midlist. And I don't know if the midlist has died, I think indie publishing is really good at cornering the midlist. I can see that. Um, the idea being that once upon a time, so for those who don't know, the midlist is um, the the books that do well enough to pay for themselves and earn a little bit more for the publisher that uh, generally are writers that are easier to work with um, because if someone's a midlister and is, is is hard to work with, then they're probably not going to pick up up. And made up the the bulk of publishing mm -hmm. for many many years. Um, and no one mostly started out wanting to be midlist. Right? There's this thing in publishing where an unpublished a, a book that you're buying that by a new author could be anything. Um, I didn't understand this when I first started. I'm sorry if I'm raining on something you guys already know, but I didn't understand. When I was first sold to Joshua, I'm like, so how much advance we get? He's like, well, they're offering this, um, but it's made up numbers that get you that. Right. I'm like, I don't understand. That doesn't seem like made up numbers. Like they obviously have numbers and figures that they would determine. He's like, no, they can pretend any number of sales. And I really started to understand that an un, um, unpublished book can be anything, right. and they will put it in a slot that they think it was likely to sell. Yeah. Um, but they're hoping that all of them will be bestsellers. 
Um, and some of them slotted, eventually became, or, or very quickly became, sta uh, very stable mid-listers that would make money. And these are kind of a lot of your working professionals in the field. Um, most people were in the mid-list. This was, you know, you, you could make a good living as a writer in what they call the mid-list, but not the best sellers. And if you're below the mid-list, then you probably aren't going to continue being published unless you're a prestige book that it's, you know, prestigious to have uh, winning awards or something. Um, and I think that a lot of those books, um, the, that's like the perfect place for indie authors. Granted, yeah. being bestseller is perfect for everyone, indie author too, but the indie authors are like, you know what? I can make, these are the people that have a dedicated following that is not huge, mm -hmm. but they, you know, they would sell 10,000 books. If you sell 10,000 books for New York in paperback, which a lot of these people would do, then you're making not a lot of money, mm -hmm. right? You're probably making like $10,000 a book. If you right. sell those 10,000 copies indie published, to the same people for the same price uh, or even cheaper, then you're making twenty or thirty thousand dollars. Or if you sell to a third as many people, yes. you're still making the same amount. Yeah, of work. exactly. Yeah. And I just think it, that group realized, wait a minute, the since I'm a midlister, the publisher doesn't do any marketing for me. Right. Since I'm a midlister, I don't get the top tier cover artists or things like that. I can do all that myself, and I should. So I have opinions on this. Yes. So this is, I think you're absolutely right about what happened. I mm -hmm. think you're wrong about why it happened. Okay, good. So this is, I, my career goal, I started out writing literary young adult. And if yes. you're interested in literary young adult, you can go to my website and still find some of those books. Um, I think they're great, but I don't write it anymore because it's really hard to sell and I've moved on to mm -hmm. other things. But um, my goal was to be a midlister. That's what, that genre was full of midlisters who were making really good money mm -hmm. writing what people kind of derogatorily call teen problem novels right? right but it's it's contemporary young adult right. um, and that's what I wanted to do and then what happened I started in 2000 and there were two things that happened and one was Twilight Hunger Games and movie money and the other was the 2008 recession okay um and so it was real viable to be a mid-lister and then the recession hits, the layoffs in publishing were atrocious. It was terrible. It was a real bad time to be in publishing. And that was when I had just gotten my first agent and sent out my first book, and it was real not good. Um, but then also during that same time period, you had things like Twilight and Hunger Games and these massive successes where at least in YA, no one had ever seen that before. Right. Harry Potter, um, Harry Potter was, yeah. started before, yeah. right? But it was part it of this. It's what kicked this off. And yeah. then it's like Harry Potter was like a unicorn. Thing. Exactly. And then... It happened several times. They started more times to be able to like, replicate Wait it. a minute. This isn't a unicorn. This is just yeah. a movement. And I don't think that people like me who mm -hmm. wanted the career that I wanted were going to just wander away because we realized it, the grass was greener because yes. indie publishing hadn't been viable for a long time and because there was this dream mm -hmm. of getting signed by a publisher and being in a bookstore. And that dream is so powerful. Right. And so everybody I know who was in that situation, um, including myself, we gave up that dream for survival in publishing. It wasn't something that we were like, oh, maybe I can do better over here. Like uh -huh. that's like really devaluing how powerful right. that was. Um, I gave it up because the dream, because um, I got to a point where I had had so many books rejected in New York that I couldn't imagine where I would get the creative energy to write another one knowing it was going to die. I remember talking yeah, about that time. Yeah, I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And so I went to indie publishing sort of like under force, like I had to. I, right. It was that or stop writing. I didn't have a choice. Thank and you. many of the people that I know who sort of were on that like mid-list track that's that's the situation, right? We didn't want to do that's it. Really, we did it because we had to. Because yeah. publishing was look, they were looking for the next big thing, and their buying model was different. And I don't want to blame editors for this. They were doing that because of layoffs and things, right? They didn't have a choice. They had to um, yeah. sell big books for their own survival. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just sort of an unfortunate economic thing that changed everything. But the end result is blockbuster mentality, right? People yeah. get dropped a lot faster mm -hmm. than they used to yeah. um, in yeah. New York publishing. It's like so either fast. your first, maybe second, if you're lucky, mm -hmm. chan you, two chances. And if you're not a bestseller, then they're like, well, we could publish this other person who might be a bestseller. It's really hard to survive. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of people who even had really, their first books did very well, but yeah. then their sales petered out and they just... And their publishers dropped them, and they moved on a lot of them to other careers because it's mm -hmm. so hard. Um, this question, um, 
I am totally fine. In fact, I'm expecting you to say pass because okay. it can stir up trouble. Oh, it's on good. a different topic. You wrote, uh, as you said, so-called teen problem novels. Yeah. Um, and you did a very good job about it. Um, and uh, I liked a lot of those books. And you, you wrote one that makes me think you might have opinions on Thirteen Reasons Why. <laughs> oh, I do have opinions on Thirteen Reasons Why. Do you want to share them, or would you rather? I can pass? share them. Okay. Um. <laughs> I have opinions about the author too. I'll pass on those. Okay. Um, but uh, 13 Reasons Why I did not like. I The book that I wrote, I wrote way before I ever read that. I think mm. I wrote it before it was published. Um, yeah. But I have a book that's about uh, a girl who her best friend has committed suicide and she finds her journal and she's trying to figure out what happened to her. Yes. Um, the reason I don't like 13 Reasons Why is that people – don't commit suicide and leave logical, th- well thought out notes behind about everything that they like, all the reasons why. If you could, in your head, figure out why and like lay it all out in this nice, like, if you could do that, then you would not be in a place where you would be so desperate to escape your own pain that you would do that. Like, this is not how mental illness works. And so I, I, it really bothers me, the misrepresentation of how and why people commit suicide. Yeah, when I, um, when I, I have not read 13 Reasons Why. So um, I have just um, seen um, and read some an- analysis of the show. Okay. So yeah. I'm just working from that background. But then when I read that analysis, I'm like, wow, this is Jancy's novel if it were irresponsible. <laughs> Um, I mean, so, yeah, but that. And maybe maybe that's going too far. I haven't actually watched the show, so I'm. I'm I haven't yeah. seen the show either because yeah. the book bothered me so mm-hmm. much. It was just the way that they're the portrayal is not that is not how it works, and it bothers me um, when mental illness. I have lots of experience with mental illness, and it really bothers me when people are perpetuating ideas about things that are not real. Yeah, a lot of people in the chat are saying it glorifies yeah suicide. Yeah, which obviously is a bad thing. Well, yeah, it, it, it's, it's very hard to write about suicide. And if you, number one, if you're having suicidal thoughts, you should get help. Get help. And uh, our society stigmatizes that mm-hmm. way too much, even accidentally. Um, but if you were going to write about it, the, um, there are guides written by mental health professionals and recommendations of things that you show and don't show in order to depict it in a story but not cause more harm than right. good. Um, and and would, there are some really good guides for that that I would recommend. I would never want to suggest that my book is perfect. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that there are all sorts of things in there that one could say, like, I shouldn't have done it this way, I shouldn't have done it that way, and then I would be like, you're right, I shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. Um, but if that's something that you want to write about mm-hmm. and you aren't someone who has been there yourself, you need to talk to people who have and really listen and understand them and yeah. not... Um, just assume that you can read a medical guide and know. Um, that's good advice for anything you're writing. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. But but some things, if you get them wrong, people maybe laugh at you, but no one gets hurt. Yes. And that one, if you get it wrong, people get hurt. Mm-hmm. Uh, several people have asked what your book is called that's in a similar vein. Everything's fine. Oh, man. I still call it Haley's Journal in my head. Haley's I Journal was the original title. I forgetting that it actually, yeah. Yeah, everything's fine. Mm-hmm. I have so many books that start with ever, by the way. Oh, actually, yeah. so I have I, everything's fine, and I have everything we are, and I have everything we might have been, which is an alternate everything we are, and now I have Evershore. Oh. And Oops. Now, and now you need to write one called Everlake. Everlake. Everlake, yeah. <laughs> I always want to put shadow in, of some sort in my my title. Um, and okay, I've, yeah. I, I, I've done it like twice. I'm like, that probably is already too many, but yeah. I have a soap opera star in the extra named Trevor Everlake. That mm. was... Oh, cool. <laughs> That's a good name. he's the character, actually. He's not the star. He's the... He's the character, yeah. Trevor Everlake, hot ah, doctor. That's a that's a great. <laughs> that one was yeah. Megan's. I can't mm. take credit for that one. Yeah, but. I like that one a lot. Uh, can we expect a cameo for Trevor Everlake? Trevor Everlake. <laughs> no, Trevor Bierlake. <laughs> 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 Obviously, oh, Trevor is a very Rasharan name. Yes. I have a question from the people on Discord. Uh oh. They wanted uh-huh. something for a, if there were ever future, um, like uh, Skyward novellas. Could I name a Tanix Hoyd? Uh, <laughs> they made the very good point uh-huh. that um, technically, since we have Old Earth, 
those would be in their literature. Oh, yeah. And okay. so technically, Brandon one Sanders could. Exists. Yes. Yes. Uh, Your copper mind editors desperately want to have to create this disambiguation page. So I was asked to ask you. I, I think that would that that is reasonable. Um, I think because people keep I, I, what I don't like to do is to confuse people on whether the cytoverse is in the Cosmere, which it's not. Which it's not. But this would totally I mean, um, in the Alcatraz <laughs> books, uh, um, Alcatraz, someone at some point um, um, says that Alcatraz's mom killed Asmodian, which is a Wheel of Time joke. There's a mystery of who killed Asmodian. Um, and so, you know, there's there's stuff like that. So, yes, you may name, awesome. you may name a slug um, hoid. We're probably going to uh, get some uh, get some boom slug stickers coming around here. Yay! So, um, yeah. Awesome. Mm-hmm. So look forward to that. I hope I didn't spoil too much, Kara. Boom slug might might have a sticker. I've seen the boom slug sticker. I love mm-hmm. it. We actually, fun fact, <laughs> we actually changed the color of the boom slug because it looked better on the sticker. Oh, did you do that? It, yeah, yeah. They were black and red, and now they're red and black. Because yeah. Isaac actually sent me. He's like, here it is black and red. Here it is red and black. And I was like, it's cool. We can change it in the book. Speaking of changing yes. books yes. to match the art, he was right. It looked better. Mm. <laughs> it's good having an artist on staff or several in our case mm-hmm. so all right so scare us somewhere that's not so controversial okay cool <laughs> um since we're about the halfway point i know we have a lot of new viewers so jancy i'm gonna let you introduce yourself in a second okay. um as i ask you this question from elijah Stormblest, they say wait i didn't realize jancy was the co-author for bastille 2 mm-hmm. what news do you have on that one does it have a release date or time frame so it doesn't have a release date. Do we are we allowed to give a release time frame? Yeah, it's fall, right? Fall next year. Fall next about year. About a year is our from goal. now. Mm-hmm. Um, I am doing a pass on it right now. Um, mm-hmm. This week, I actually just reread The Dark Talent yesterday because I. It's been a while. I wrote this book. When did I write it? Oh, a while been, ago. Two, while. two years. Yeah. yeah two it's years. Horror has been. It's been hard to get this through the pipeline. It's. It, it was sitting behind a lot of other things that. Mm-hmm. And so. Um. But I of course read all the books and was very up on the continuity back then. And then I go to this revision and yeah. people are like, "Where is Shasta?" And I'm like, "I don't know. <laughs> Where is Shasta? Better and go back and read it." A very different type of collaboration because I yeah. wrote half of that book mm-hmm. and then got stumped. Yeah. Um. Mostly because I had to move on to another project and then I came back to it. I'm like. I just got, yeah. that's the number one t- way I get stumped on books is if I have to stop it halfway and then go do something else and come back to it. Mm-hmm. Um, this is what happened with, uh, with um, The Arithmetist, where I finished the book mm-hmm. and then had to, like, years later come back to try to come up with a series, a right. sequel. And um, anyway, um, so I called Jancy and said, help! <laughs> um, and Bastille's voice wasn't quite working. Uh, if you're not familiar with the series, the first five books are from one character's viewpoint, and the sixth and final book is by another character's viewpoint, um, because the first character promised that there were only five books who would not write anymore, and so yeah. now the true ending has to be written by his friend who is not putting up with his crap and not finishing the story. Uh, that's the joke. Um, and the voice wasn't quite working, and so I was on a plane, I think, and I called you. Um, or texted you. I think you texted me, yeah. I texted you, and I'm like, help, yeah. can you fix Alcatraz? And so Jancy came on and did a pass for the voice and then wrote the second half of the book based on kind of brainstorming and stuff that we came up with. So That was like the best text ever. Would mm-hmm. you be interested in writing the Bastille book mm-hmm. and the Al- Alcatraz? And I'm like, um, yes. <laughs> yes, sign me up. I had always been an Alcatraz fan. I love those books. I wrote that first one. Right when, oh, right in 2005 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, 2005, something like yeah. that. Yeah, um, when we were so. all hanging out. Mm-hmm. Back in the back in the days before we got married and had families, and yeah. now when we hang and, and careers, now when we hang out, it's live in front of people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know if that happens to you, but like, I like I only hang out with people now in like scheduled moments right and that's better than a lot of my friends who just don't hang out with people yeah. anymore um i found that i just have to have it on the schedule to be like i'm doing this thing with a friend and yeah i work with my friends so like oh, yeah. megan and i we're together all the time yes <laughs> it works you out real go, well go pose barbies and, yeah mm-hmm. um, and yep. have arguments between them yeah but virtually all my social interaction is work related mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that is that is me too. Like, yeah. even if I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go out to dinner with my brother-in-law and my sister. It's Adam and Jane, and I'm at dinner, and Adam Adam's like, oh, I've got this new idea for this thing, and I'm like, oh, I had this other idea for this thing, and yeah. I still still have my. Um, I met my husband playing D and D. We mm-hmm. actually play Iron Kingdoms, but no one knows what that is. Um, and we're still we still do that game. We're still going Thursday nights. So I canceled this week, but. <laughs> Sorry, Drew. Uh, People will find this fascinating because I still find it fascinating. I think we have an interesting, different sort of job. Drew has one of the most interesting, different sort of jobs I've ever heard of. Mm -hmm. So my husband paints gaming miniatures for a living. Like, he does a lot of 40K minis. Um, He does a lot of, like, Reaper minis for people for their games. Um, He also... In doing that, someone, one of his clients one time said, hey, could you make a wedding cake topper that's my, like, fiancé as a zombie and me wearing, like, a fallout mask? And he did, and he put it on the internet, and now about half of our business is wedding cake toppers of people with dragons and people with lightsabers. Don't tell Lucas. No, no, no. And <laughs> light Distinctive swords. Distinctive swords, laser swords. Right, yeah. He doesn't uh, label them that when he yes. puts them online. Mm-hmm. but. He's done, he did one once of a girl standing on top of a companion cube. Mm. Like, he's done all kinds of crazy things. And so, yeah, he paints. We both work from home. I write, and he paints. He has a desk in my kitchen, and my kids do online school, and we are all just crazy all the time. It's that life that I always thought people would be jealous of, and then everyone had to live during the pandemic, and Uh it turns out the rest of the world hates it. It's just me. Uh. That's my life. (laughs) Uh, I've always just thought that was super cool. Uh, We should have... Drew on sometimes. You just should talk about painting minis as yeah. a living. Yeah, uh, and he paints really good minis. Yeah. He does it full time, and he always has. Like he left college, we started a business, and that's what he's always done. Is it still under Garden Ninja? Garden Ninja, yeah, yeah Garden Ninja Studios. If you want to mm-hmm. go check him out, he's real good. Yep. Do you want your your minis painted? <laughs> Granted, I think there's usually a pretty long waiting list. It's not too bad. Yeah, like a month or two right now. Okay. Yeah, but so. it ain't cheap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is real good so he gets to charge a lot of money so questions not about painting minis so we don't have so, drew here yeah and i was um reading so i'm not sure did you reintroduce yourself i didn't that? okay i'm gonna let um, you do that since we're about the halfway point i'm jancy patterson i write lots of books um i just recently we, we put out sunreach i co-authored the first the um novellas in the skyward series i've yes. been talking too long i'm starting Which to i hope that you will all go check out uh because they turned out really well. And I just want to say thank you to the the community response on that has been incredible. Like the just the things people have been saying and the ways that I've been treated by your fans are just amazing people. So thank you to all of you for being so wonderful. It's been I was I've been really afraid for many years now since we started talking about Bastille as to what the community response would be to me mm-hmm. coming in as sort of like this interloper in your work and it's just been amazing. I would guess that you know, a significant number of my fan base still uh, was uh, following me during the Wheel of Time days. Yeah. And are used yeah, to this so. idea. So you were the interloper That I was ones. the interloper. And yeah, so, that's true. Um, the ones that stuck around are the ones that are okay with that. Yeah. Maybe. So, you know, and Robert Jordan wrote Conan books. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so anyway. So uh, Brian L. from the chat says, does FM have any death metal in her playlist? And would Spinsa like it? She has the uh, ROM sign. Oh, so a bunch of people on Discord kept asking me. So I made the playlist, FM's playlist. It's on my website. If you go to jancypatterson.com and you click on the blog, it's the top post. I did it in Spotify. And that's like, obviously, you can imagine her music as whatever it is. And whatever you're imagining is correct. But those are the songs that I listened to when I wrote those descriptions. So any death metal on that list? Is Rammstein death Rammstein's metal? Rammstein's not is it? death metal, but it's That's the closest close. we got. Rammstein, I think, at least is... I mean, uh, she's got a lot of music on there. It might what? be on there somewhere, but as far as what's in the yeah. book. Is Rammstein industrial metal? Tell us in the chat. Metal people are very particular about their subgenres. Okay. So, uh, I put that in there. It's an Easter egg because Brandon introduced me to them. I was writing in the back of his convertible back when he had a convertible yes. with the back. Yes. <laughs> I don't even have a convertible anymore. Isn't that oh, sad? no. I sold Compi. That is I tragic. I was never driving Compi, so, oh, you know. That's so, too bad. Um, Industrial metal is what people are calling yeah. it. Okay. And so uh, they the think the we Garden Ninja website crashed. <laughs> Did so, you crash my website? Uh, welcome. Yeah. Awesome. Check out the Garden Ninja website tomorrow. 
<laughs> Sorry, Drew. Again. First. Probably now mine is crashing probably then too. Yes, and uh, Jancy's uh, website is in the description. You may need to refresh it, but it is there. Mm. <laughs> Try it tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, this this happened to us too recently. Yeah. We thought we oh, had yeah. like servers that could handle it, right? We're right. promised mm -hmm. we can handle this. We're like, all right, we launched our con, boom, broken. <laughs> like, yeah. come on, it's uh, and your blog has also crashed. Yeah, it's, try it tomorrow. You know, <laughs> it's the twenties. Shouldn't we be able to have websites right. that don't crash? Because it'll all still yeah. be there. Mm. Go in groups, <laughs> not all at once. <laughs> Leave yourself a note. <laughs> so even numbers get to go today, odd numbers tomorrow. Yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all right. Okay. Uh, Garen L. says, as someone who is looking to self-publish, what's something you wish someone had told you when you started that would have made the process better or easier? Is that for me? I'm going to yes, guess because probably. my answer would be be famous first. Mm, be famous first. <laughs> my answer, and people don't like this answer, I didn't like this answer very much when it was me who was there. It's going to be okay. Like, that's really what I wish I had known was like, you're going to run into a lot of setbacks and things are not going to go the way you want them to go. Like, maybe you'll be the person who puts out one book and everything goes fantastically for you. I don't know any of those people. Um, maybe they exist. But... Aragon. That wasn't self-published, was it? It was. I guess it was, wasn't it? Yeah. That was a different... It was, was a, a different, different world. Era. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were hand selling physical copies, weren't they? Yeah, so what he did is he kind of um, invented the go to a school, yeah. do a presentation, yeah. sell to the students mm -hmm. at the school thing that became the standard for middle grade after. Yeah, that's still a viable mm -hmm. way to go for middle grade. Yeah. The Martian may also count for that as well because that the, started as a serial and then he sold yes. it and then it got picked up. It yeah. does happen. but It does happen, Yes, but, but not to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but... The thing, I think that the most important quality you can have as a writer, no matter how you're publishing, is grit. You have, if you want it bad enough, then you will stick with it and you will keep pivoting and figuring out what is your next step, um, regardless of what happens outside of you, outside of your control. And if you don't, that's okay too. Mm. But that's sort of the thing to do to succeed is just stick with it. So I have a question for you along those lines. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is, um, so indie publishing is in, versus just publishing should not be in people's heads as a mark of quality or not. No. There are excellent indie published books and there are mediocre uh, traditionally published books and that's not, at the same time, I worry that if I had had indie publishing uh, as viable, I would have published my first books. Mm. And the jump in quality between book one and two is so steep for me and for a lot of my friends. And then that steepness kind of levels out, but still like through books three and four to the point that once you have written for five books for most of us, some people it's you revise the same book over and over and then you, get, right. you learn that way. But for most people I know, that jump in quality is so yeah. high that it, and probably unduly, worries me that people are going to run out, indie publish their first couple of books, get discouraged because they aren't, Right. You know, they haven't learned those lessons yet, right. where if they'd waited till books three and four even, that they would have so much larger a chance of success. Yeah. Um, is that a wrong way for me to be thinking, though? I don't think it is. I think people talk about people putting out books that are their early books that really yeah. aren't up to, say, a professional standard. Mm -hmm. um, like it's this terrible thing. I mean – they're probably not going to sell, right? And there yeah. being a bunch of books on Amazon that aren't selling probably isn't really a problem. Yeah. And the worst thing that's going to happen to you is you're going to run your name into the ground and you're going to have to change your name, which we do in publishing all the time. Yes. So I don't think that people doing that is actually a problem. Uh huh. Getting discouraged, though, is more of yeah. a concern. And being aware that maybe you're going to want to change your name if you don't take off after right. your first couple of books. Right. Um, maybe. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, but you can write a really excellent couple of books, too, and put them out and get real discouraged, too. Yes. It's really hard to do anything with two books Yeah. Um, in self-publishing. And so I feel like that's probably totally a problem. But Ooh. like... Sorry. <laughs> Warbreaker? Warbreaker. It's suddenly colorful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the answer is... Publishing is discouraging. Mm -hmm. Get discouraged, but if you want it, don't give up. Yeah. Because 
it's all discouraging. I mean, it's a self-selecting crowd, but I often yeah. talk about the fact that my friends from college who stuck with it are the, there's a remarkable number of them that are full-time writers, even if they are not household names. I mean, not many writers are, um, yeah. but even if they are not yeah. uh, bestsellers, um, uh, the ones who stuck with it still are still publishing mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, but, you know, I do have to put the little asterisks on that because our good friend Bryce is an amazing writer mm -hmm. and has stuck with it mm -hmm. and has just run into wall after wall in the publishing. I mean, he's published a few books, but it's like he publishes a book and then the publisher folds or he publishes a book or he sells a book and then the publisher you know, gets a new editor and then they never publish the book mm -hmm. or things like that. So, Well, and sometimes I feel like people look around and they feel like everybody's making it but them, but it's because mm. they don't see other people's numbers. Like I don't yeah. make a full-time living in the sense that I make a reasonable salary yeah. as a writer. I never have. Um, when eventually someday I get paid for the books that I've written, then I will. And yes. it'll be the first time ever. Um, but my husband does make a full-time living and that's why I can do this. Mm. Um, and so I'm very lucky. Like that's privilege is what it is. Um, I did not make a full-time living. My first, I think three, four years, yeah. and I survived on my sweet, sweet uh, income from my, my sugar mama, Emily, mm -hmm. who was a public school teacher, Yep. and that, <laughs> that big salary check was what yeah. I was able to be a writer because of. Yeah, so just because even somebody, just because you know their name and mm -hmm. they publish books, I have 30-something books out. Mm -hmm. And I'm not making what like one would expect to make as a salary of a, as a full time employee anywhere. Right. Yeah. So that's I mean that's the reality of the industry. It is it's entertainment. Yeah. Um. And it, there's a lot of whims to it, and they don't correspond to quality. Yeah. Uh, pretty much. Unfortunately. Um. Fun so. fact. Oh, I'm gonna grab another pen here. Sorry if I'm going off screen. Many years ago, uh -huh. I remember, and I think you got this from Dave. Harland? Maybe. Um, I remember you saying, this is very like early in my career, you saying that, I, I think it's a quote from Dave, that everybody you know who's been writing for 10 years has been published and everybody who's been like that writing consistently for yeah. 20 years, but I heard it from you Yep. Um, for 20 years is making a full-time living at it. And I remember sitting there and thinking, I can do that. Mm -hmm. Two things about that. One, I really underestimated how hard that second 10 years was yeah. going to be. Way harder than the first 10 years. Yeah. Like, but I did. I sold a book right about 10 years from when I started writing. Um, and then that second 10 years when I have not been making a full-time living was real rough. That's real hard. But it will have been about 20 years, about 21. Yeah. And that's because of you who yeah. told me that. I just mm. think that's fun. <laughs> yeah. Because without this project... I don't know when I ever would have made a full-time living at it. So, And you are so good as a writer. <laughs> Thank you. You are an excellent example of how it can be kind of kind of rough sometimes out yeah. there. you got to um, be in the right place at the right time. Well, and I wouldn't even say that anymore, right? Because I have in my writing group, Kaylin. I don't know that you know Kaylin. Oh, I do know Kaylin. Uh, yeah. Kaylin is a legit genius at writing. Mm -hmm. She is amazing, right? Her books are so good. But Kaylin... Um, she has, um, how should we say, um, uh, she is not an aggressive personality. Mm. Um, and she has done some, like, she has gone to cons and things, which is totally outside her comfort zone, way outside. Yeah. And, you know, done the meeting with editors and stuff and things like that, which is a method to, not the only method, but it is a method. And, you know, I mean, I will applaud her all day for going and doing that. Um, but, you know, she is... She is disadvantaged by our society mm. that focuses on the squeaky wheel and the very persistent uh, person, right? And, um, and you know, she has never sold a book at all. Uh, she actually had um, my editor, Moshe, offered on one. Right. And then Moshe um, sometimes is not the most reliable person in publishing, uh, because of certain things that he deals with, and it just fell through the cracks. Yeah, I was and, heartbroken for her when that yeah. happened. Yeah. Um, and so, like, there's an example of a person who 20 years mm -hmm. has been writing and has not sold a book and has not broken in, and 
is, I mean, genius caliber yeah. writer. No, for sure. Right? Yeah. And I bet there's a ton yeah. of, uh, of Kay Lynn's yeah, out Yeah, no, there. I don't think that thing you said was true. Yeah. <laughs> I don't it's think it was true, true at all. all. Uh, no. Um, though, I, just I have modeled anecdote. it to change to people who are persistent at it get good enough to be published. Oh, yeah. And yeah. write s successful books in the fact that they are great novels. And I don't know anybody who hasn't been doing it long enough. Like, Yeah, no, that's true. You can get good enough that you are going to be writing books that you are proud of that could stand up against any, like, I. and my proof of this is Alan Layton. Do you know Alan very I know, well? I know Alan. I've never read Alan's work. Um, so Alan Layton, um, I... Um, he, he, he shows up in my books as cameos all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, he's one of these people that I put in one of my, one of my, um, my dearest friends, um, wonderful human being and his writing when he started was just so bad. Um, it would just, I think he has a reading disability undiagnosed mm -hmm. where he'll talk about reading a book and he'll spend way longer on a page reading than anyone else will. Um, and he has no inherent grasp of punctuation um, in a very distracting way. Um, and beyond that, you know, his first novel that he wrote was about his D&D &D character, who was a goblin who was really annoying. And it was, yeah, anyway. Was the goblin named Kathy? <laughs> oh, burn. <laughs> She's been saying stuff in the chat, so I had to take my phone. Yeah. Um, but regardless, Alan's latest books that he's written are as good or better than anything I read off the shelf at the bookstore. Uh, That's awesome. Like, Alan is an, a legit excellent writer now, uh, which is just incredible, right? His punctuation still has problems at times. Um, that's and, what editors are and for. And that's what editors are for. But, uh, man, Alan's a good writer. That's awesome. And ba if, if Alan can do it, you can do it. But Alan is a is a school teacher, right? Mm -hmm. He's a math teacher. His aspirations are not to be a professional writer. Um, his aspirations are to write books in his free time because it's very satisfying and fulfilling. Um, and I sure would like to see him sell one someday just yeah. so that people can experience, you know, his really cool writing that he's uh, spent 20 years crafting how to do. But the market, like the number of really great books that have gone nowhere that I've seen tells me that you just can't make promises like that at Oh, all. yeah. No, it's, yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. I think the reason I say you have to be in the right place at the right time, like it's actually yeah. three pieces. You have to be the right person in the right place at the right time, and the only yeah. one you can control is becoming the right person. That's yeah. what you can control, Yep. and you can't control anything else. Yeah, exactly. So not to be depressing. Mm. I, what I say in my class is true. You can find success at writing, but you can't guarantee success monetarily in writing. I can virtually guarantee you will be able to train yourself to write really excellent books that you that people will love reading. Whether anyone will pay you money for that <laughs> is up in the air. And let me just say this, if this is a subject that's interesting to anyone who's listening, the Freakonomics podcast has a great episode about stick to mm. uh, which uh, I think is good. Mm -hmm. So check that out. Uh, anyway, a uh, question for Brandon from Metroid413. They say, I would like to start with not a question, but a word of thanks. I've been dealing with leukemia and lots of chemo lately, and the backlog of streams plus intentionally blank has been a wonderful distraction on top of the books, of course. So thank you, Brandon. It is my pleasure. Um, I like having this, and I'll let you get to the question in a second. I like having this because um, I do have this thing where I'll write the book, and like a Stormlight book will take 18 months of work. And then I'll release the book, and the next day people will be like, that was so good. When's the next one? I'm like, <laughs> um, so if, I, if, I, if this content that I can legitimately produce weekly is, uh, is helpful to you, that makes me feel really good. Me too. Yes, Adam does a lot of work behind the scenes on these things. So their question, uh, does the outline revision process change substantially when shifting between something like the Stormlight Archive, Mistborn, and Skyward, or is it all pretty much the same? Uh, it does change. So um, Stormlight is its own thing. Stormlight is on a tier by itself because 
the number of characters, the fact that I'm doing flashback sequences for all of them that are in continuity, the weirdness of the world and the high storms and things like this mean that the editing and revision process, plus they're 400,000 word novels, right? They're four times as long as most novels I'm writing uh, with all these. They're, they're just, they're a huge snarl of, um, of plots to interweave and get right. And it is, uh, it is by far the hardest thing I do professionally is, uh, is write Stormlight books. Um, the tier below that is any sequel to a book I've already written uh, is a tier more difficult um, than the next tier down, which is the first book in a series, followed by a tier of a one-off that's not intended to be uh, anything. So um, anything not intended to have a long series. And the, these tiers mean the amount of difficulty it is in arranging all the pieces where they need to be, of making sure that character arcs are still happening, but not repeating what happened before or invalidating what happened before. Mm -hmm. That's a really undiscussed uh, issue with sequels, is making sure that the characters grow, but don't just repeat themselves. I can't um, tell you how many times when I'm outlining books with Megan, yeah. we were doing a book, another book with the same characters, and we're like, oh, that, we did that story already, not that. And then we'll yeah. talk some more, and we're like, oh, we've got something we think is really brilliant. Oh, no, that's the same story again. Yeah. Back to the drawing board. Yeah. Um, and so the, the difference in the editing process is the number of eyes that I make sure are on it, uh, the amount of continuity editing I'm planning to do, and the care and attention I know I'm going to need to give the character arcs in particular. Mm -hmm. um, because the easiest of all of these is here's an, a new different character with a new different problem, beginning, middle, and end, done. I have explored that character. When I'm developing someone like Kaladin, I know I'm going to have books and books in the future, so I'm like, what can be satisfying but still leave room for growth for the rest of the, 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 the series? And how can I make sure when I'm writing this next book three years from now, I can pick up on that and go forward with it. That's just, it's it's much more difficult. So, so excellent question. And yes, it is, uh, uh, it is, I, I can see why it's much easier, um, like a lot of the releasing quickly sort of things you do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's much easier if you want to do that to have a, a sort of more static character like James Bond or uh, somebody like this that it's like about the plot. It's way more plot driven. Even if this character learns something, I can see why it's Ian Fleming could write many, yeah. many of those, right? Yeah, I could totally see that. Um, and I can see why it's so effective to do the series with a different group uh, with each character being a new novel. Like I think Cinder did this, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like you introduce a group of friends and um, then the first book is the first friend story, the second book is the second friend story, the third book is the third friend story, and things like that uh, can really help so that you don't have to run into these sorts of things as much. That's what we do with our rom-coms. They're mostly yeah. like somebody loosely connected is now having their own romance. There's a couple of sequels too, but mostly it's that. And we were doing those uh, one a month, and, and that went great. We'd already written most of them yeah. before we did that. We weren't trying to write them one a month, but doing production. And then we put out an epic fantasy trilogy, and we put those out one a month. And they were written, same as the others, but we assumed that because they were twice as long, they would be twice as much work on the production end. And they were about five times as much work on the production end because of the continuity and all of that. Yeah, yeah. So there's a little tip. If you want to be able to release things faster, you might be... Don't do release like epic fantasies one a month. Yeah. This is on, we ha Megan and I have a list. We call it our never again mm. list. And that is on our list. We will never do that again. This is why I do one <laughs> every three years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were written, mm -hmm. but. Yeah. Mm. No, we had this, uh, yeah. And I've, I've told this story too many times. <laughs> I wrote two of the Wax and Wayne books kind of back to back. Right. And so the publisher released them back to back. Right. And that's kind of under the never, never again, again thing for us Yeah. As well. Yeah. It might be easier now that uh, I don't have to go on the road mm -hmm. to tour because I'm just not doing that anymore. Right. Uh, thank, thank you, COVID. You've done mostly miserable things to the world. But one of the things you've done that uh, is good for me is I am now live streaming instead of going on tour. That's awesome. And 
This means more time to play Terraria with my kids. <laughs> Are you playing anything with your kids or with your husband right now? Uh, I've been playing Shadow of Mordor with my kids. Oh, that's right. I asked. You can all you. judge me for that. <laughs> <laughs> did you? Really good. Uh, it is good. But did you? You skip the opening cut scene. We skipped yeah, the opening I think cut you scene. Told me that. Yeah. We skipped the opening. If cut you scene. skip the opening yeah. cut scene, yeah. then you just there orcs. There orcs. Stab a stab. My kids stab. think it's great. Okay, I played <laughs> Doom Eternal with my eleven-year-old. Awesome. So nice. Uh, I figured I was playing Doom at that age. Well, Doom was not. Was You're a dad, Wolf. though. It's cool for you to do sort of irresponsible yeah, things. I'm it? a mom. Oh. Moms get hated on for doing sort of irresponsible things. That's how the internet works. That is an unfairness <laughs> that I hadn't realized. I knew that it's unfairness totally exists, but that's a specific example yeah. of. But mm-hmm. yeah, my my eleven year old, uh, he loves um, gory stuff from the kind of conceptual level. Like he loves watching in a movie where gory stuff happens. He's like, "How did they do that? Is oh, that is that computer like or is that blood or is that a thing?" And then we'll like stop it and be like, "All right, it, it's this. We'll look it up online." That's He'll be awesome. like, "How is that how is that person on fire?" And we'll be like, "Oh, there's these cool fire suit things." He's like, "Can I have one?" I'm like, "No." But um and so <laughs> When you grow up, you can. Yes. Um <laughs> and so that. something like That's like so I cool. base like Doom Eternal, he's not going to have nightmares. He doesn't. Right. He doesn't. Yeah, care. my kids don't. He's going to be like, oh, it's CG things like this. Another of my children might, and okay. so, um, so with Dallin, I can very excitedly rip demons in half. But with another <laughs> child, uh, I will do something else. We're playing yeah. Terraria again because the last update of Terraria came out nice. a year or so ago, and it's just a delightful game to play with a um, ver- a variety of skill levels of children. And an nice. adult who still wants to have fun. Um, and awesome. a good mix of like building mechanics and sandboxing a little bit. And so, yeah. Nice. And uh, Jancy, I just want you to know that our friend of the program, Evgeny, uh, says he is from the internet. <laughs> and he's here to say that you are a cool mom. Awesome. Yes. I want to be a cool mom, not an irresponsible mom. <laughs> uh, so this next one is directed to Brandon, but I think both of you can answer. Mm-hmm. Um, they, oh, and it's from Agile Bum, which I think is a funny name. Mm. So, uh, Agile Bum says... My children have Agile Bums. Yeah. <laughs> you are often praised by fans for doing endings especially well. What do you think is the key to a satisfying ending that doesn't feel too neat? Yeah. Um, boy, good question on the second half of that, right? The, the too neat part is, uh, is not one people bring up that often. Um, so I would say that um, part one, basically watch my lecture on promises, progress, payoff, right? Um, It's a mix of learning to do that, of learning to make a good promise and asking what's going to fulfill that promise. And you're going to have a danger. Um, Your danger is that narratives you've read so far have told you what that ending should be and what the motions you should go through are to make it happen but they will leave out the the key part. Your brain will leave out the key part, which is the emotional impact that has on the character and why this person is doing that. Um, I just watched a movie that was very fun, and it has one of these moments um, where, like, um, a character at the end says to another character that there's been a fleeting romance with that you should go to this other person, right? It's like, I'm giving you permit, I'm letting go, right? And that's that's a trope that you've seen, and it can work. It can totally work if this is part of the story. In this one, it felt like there was no motivation for the character to say this. It was actually counter to the narrative of the story. It's just the beat that happens in that movie at that point. So the you internalize putting that beat in. And since it's a Hollywood film, it's totally possible that all the foreshadowing and proper things was there, but they had to trim the, the movie down and they ended up cutting out that stuff. You never can tell. Um, but regardless, the issue is that piece. That's the piece that is the satisfying, the piece of why this character, why would they do this thing it, not just because this is what the trope that the plot calls for. What does it mean to them, and why are they doing it? And if they wouldn't, then what it means is if you it is that you've internalized this plot, but you have not actually connected it to the narrative you're writing specifically. Awesome. Any? Do you want to? 
Uh, Brandon can detest I used to be real bad at endings. He read some of my early terrible endings. I was so bad at it. I learned to do endings um, mostly from Save the Cat. Um, and from Save the Cat, what I learned was that there are certain beats in a story that virtually all stories do. Mm-hmm. And if you don't do them, then your story doesn't work. Um, I have a whole lecture that I do for Brandon's class when I get to sub for it about about that um, and about how to take what um, – what Save the Cat offers and use it to revise your stories based on the feedback you're given, which obviously I can't give the whole lecture right now. But yeah. if your ending isn't working, your setup's probably broken. That's the short version. Yeah. I think that's... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, this next one is, again, from Cheyenne Al Sheridan for Jancy. And uh, they say, Brandon has talked about foresh- foreshadowing before but I like studying different styles. Mm. What's your method for foreshadowing? Foreshadowing. I like to, um, so I'm assuming that we're talking about like, there's a mystery, but, and we want to like leave the breadcrumb trail, but we don't want to give it away. You can answer. So that's what what I'm assuming is meant. If they want to clarify in the comments, then we can talk about what they really meant. Um, The way that I learned how to do that from Veronica Mars um, and I won't like totally give away the first season of Veronica Mars, but it is like a masterclass in plotting. It's brilliant. And the, the who did it at the end, the way that they set it up, and I won't, I won't say what it is, but the way that they set it up is there's a character that has to do with one of the other characters' um, emotional arc and nothing to do with the plot. He never touches the plot. Like, they do not interact ever. And they build him up to be the worst person in the world. And you never think, maybe therefore the worst person in the world did it, because the, the plots don't connect. And so the way that I, the method that I like to use is finding places where it's easily explainable by the reader why this information is here for totally other reasons than the information that I have really put it there, right? So when the reader says, yeah. why is this here? They know why it's there. It's for X side reason. That's not why it's there. That's the camouflage, right? Whereas if you put information in and there's no reason why it's there, they spot your foreshadowing instantly and then they know exactly what's going to happen. That is really good advice. That is excellent advice. Uh, it's it's often like when people talk about red herrings, that's what mm-hmm. they're talking about, but they don't really explain it as well as you just explained that. Yeah. The readers are smart. They've read a lot of stories. Mm-hmm. When a piece falls into place, they know why it's there right. and so you have to play off of that but readers aren't going to sit there and knowing why something's there ask themselves why else it might yes, be there because exactly. they're going to move on with the story yep mm-hmm. and if you've watched a movie and been like well that's the killer it's because there's no other reason for that person to be in the narrative right. and they're the only person left that could be it so you you put it together if you are like i can't figure out who the killer is it's because often perhaps the killer is there for another purpose and yeah. I love to watch procedurals while I'm mm-hmm. doing other things. My favorite is Bones. And there's a section of about three seasons in Bones where you can tell who did it because they are the first person to show up and speak and not have a, a reason, or like be connected to yeah. the murder plot mm-hmm. at all. Yeah. And so like my husband and I would be like, there, it's her, it's him. And for there's like several seasons where every episode it's actually true. And then eventually they catch on and they start not doing that. But uh, ra- authors are really, really fun, quote unquote to watch movies with um, because uh, analyzing plots is part of what we do. And um, like I went to uh, get my hair cut today. Uh, There's my nice haircut for you guys. And my my stylist, um, Patrick, and I were chatting about a movie that I'd recently say. And he's like, yeah, I enjoyed that. And I'm like, yeah. And then I started talking about, Mm -hmm. you know, the plot structure stuff. He's like, oh, I forgot how I was talking to you. Let's talk (laughs) about something else. I'm like, all right. Um, I actually don't watch very many, like, fictional narratives anymore. A Mm. few. But they have to be really excellent because otherwise I start tearing them apart and now I'm working and I'm supposed to be relaxing. And Mm. so I watch a ton of reality TV. Right. Because I can't blame the writer Mm. in reality TV. It's never the writer's fault. And so it makes me not work and actually watch something and enjoy myself like a normal human being. That's why I play magic. Nice. Uh, Same thing. Yeah. there's, there's no, uh, no engaging that part of my brain. Exactly. Uh, in the, in the game. Yeah. So. And like my husband loves to tear apart movies and stuff. It's one of the things we do together, which is awesome. Yeah. Except for me, it's work, and mm. so there's only so much of that I can handle. Uh, Brian L says, "Quote unquote, readers are smart. I'll prove you wrong." <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I should say, 
a reader is smart. We'll quote Tommy Lee Jones, right, right from Men in Black. I'm going to get the quote wrong, but it's the you quote. Know, I that, never watched Men in oh, Black. Okay. Oh, wow. I have never seen it. Well, I there's to. a really great quote where um, where Tommy Lee Jones is speaking to Will Smith, and he says, um, and like Will Smith has said something like, "People are smart," or something like that, and he's like, "A person is smart. People are." Big, dumb animals with a mob mentality that do stupid things, and you know it. And it's way more pithy than that. Um, but nice. it's kind of this thing that a given person, you know, is smart. But as a, as a group, sometimes we aren't so smart. And uh, it's, it's presented very well. That's awesome. And it's Tommy Lee Jones. And so the delivery is excellent also. Awesome. Um, I'm really bad at quotes. Are you good at quotes? No. I'm just terrible at quotes. I'm like, like oh, that moment is cool. something like that. Right. See, I was roommates with multiple Jenningses, Ken and his right. brother Nathan, and um, they're very good at quotes. Uh, okay. uh, Ken, if you, you're, I'm, I'm sure you're very surprised that Ken Jennings is good mm, at remembering yeah, quotes. Um, but yes, and so I had uh, them and uh, our, our good friend Earl are just like really good at dredging up a quote from The Simpsons that they've only watched the episode once and it was 13 years ago and then they get it exact. Um, wow. I can't even quote my own books. Oh, so. yeah, no. Mm. Now my favorite questions are people when people are like, why did this happen in your book? And I'm like, I don't know. You know better than I know. I would have to go look. I can usually answer that pretty well, but because people are asking about the books that are continuing series yeah. that I'm yeah. yeah. But uh but sometimes people come to me with, with questions about like the Rhythmatist, mm -hmm. which, you know, I wrote in two thousand seven um and have not written a sequel. And and I'll be like, Yeah. Uh that's a fun story. I'm going to tell the story about our terrible continuity problems. So I had just read Starsight. Uh-huh. And I won't give spoilers for Starsight. I had just read Starsight, and Brandon, of course, wrote Starsight. And then we built a whole outline based on something not happening that very much does happen at the end of Starsight. And mm -hmm. I, I did this whole outline. I finished my part of the outline. I sent it off at like 1 a.m. I went mm -hmm. to bed. My daughter was reading these books. And my, mom come, or my daughter comes in, and she says, Mom... I just got to the part where this happens and wakes me up and I just turned in this outline and I was like, oh, that happens, does it? Yes, because I did a big <laughs> revision. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is not to like, I mean, I yeah. authors are terrible with continuity on their own books. This is why we need other people. Yeah. That's my mm -hmm. point is not to criticize you, but like, but no, I can't remember what happened yeah. in my books mm. and then I outline things and then they don't make any sense. Yeah, I wish I could forget what happens in Kathy's books. <laughs> Mm. Uh, and I'm sorry to, uh, to make everyone get a little peek behind the curtain, uh, but Brandon, you have a call at eight. Did you want to eat I do dinner have a call. before? I'll eat dinner after. Okay. Um, so that means we can, if we end at 7.50, okay. um, uh, which is 13 minutes away, uh, we, I will have to end a little bit early. I've got a Hollywood call. Uh, Hollywood works on different hours a lot of times than, uh, than normal <laughs> businesses, and so I'll need to be on that. Um, so. Uh, and then Petite Dragon Turtle says, question for Adam, why is he literally the worst? You know, I wish I could answer that, but mm. I agree. <laughs> we, we just imagine if he weren't married to Jane, who is the opposite of the worst. She My sister is the, opposite of the, worst, is the most sure. amazing individual. And so, you know, I do think I need one more stack probably, Maybe guys. A small stack. I'll only get part of it. Yeah. Okay. Nope. We we will go ahead and do one more stack because uh, I got 12 minutes left. So. So you probably won't answer this question, Brandon. Ooh. Um, but, Raffo. But Gracie Moo Eight says, "What's Chris's favorite magic system?" Uh, she does not think any of them are magic, and so it would be in some sort of fiction book she's read in World. Okay. That's more They're than I thought. They're all just would science. Get. Oh, and I'm sorry, I gotta. Oh, sorry, Kara. Um, this one's to Brandon and company. I don't know if that's yes. everyone over here or everyone over here. Um, are there any words or phrases uh, from Brandon's books, and maybe I'll expand this to all books, that you constantly find using in your daily life? Uh-huh. No matey. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, we know Kellen's answer. <laughs> uh, um, I'll, I'll go first. Like, anytime I see yeah. the number 42. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, or, you know, when someone asks me a question, 42 is often an answer. But I would say that the people on the Internet who have gotten way into their prequel memes have changed the, mm. the way that I interact with certain uh, phrases, like, hello there. I'm like, oh, no. You have... You have made me think not of Star Wars, but of you thinking of Star Wars <laughs> now when you say that. I did watch Better Off Dead, forced my wife to watch Better Off Dead, which is one of the movies that my brother and I quote incorrectly from our childhood <laughs> all the time. And, um, and she pretended to like it. <laughs> um, this next question is from Riley Willoughby. And they say, Jancy, you have now mentioned two TV shows. What TV show do you think has the best writing? Not necessarily your favorite, but one that has written very strongly throughout. This actually is my favorite, Breaking Bad. Mm -hmm. That I I am a big fan of tragedies. I love tragedies, and that that show is just written so well. I love it so much. It's a good answer. You can watch me and Will Friedel talk about television shows on uh, on a previous <laughs> episode. Um, but he's from Boy Meets World. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That was mm -hmm. awesome. I haven't yeah. watched it, but I need to. Yeah. And he yeah. may even be watching. He says he watches these. So. Mm. I totally yes. had a crush on him when I was like uh, 12. You, you and yes. everyone else. Right? Mm -hmm. Me and everyone else. I wonder, I, I, I didn't ask him this, but um, like he does a ton of other stuff. He's really a quite an excellent voice actor now. But one of the things that happens, I think, more often with people in Hollywood than uh, with writers is that people know him mm -hmm. for one thing he did and always will know him for that one thing he did. Um, I think that happens to some writers. It like, does. Like Orson Scott Card will always be asked about Ender's Game until the end of time. It doesn't matter what else he does. Yeah, that's true. Though... Very good point, though. Of course, Orson Scott Card wrote more sequels to Ender's Game all through the course of his career. It's true. Kind of monopolizing That's on that. True. It's not something he did. That There are plenty of authors who did one thing yeah. and then yeah, never went true. back to it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Also, the benefit of being an author who's known for one thing is you can keep doing it, whereas actors don't own the things yeah. that they're known for, and so they can't. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, uh, the When I once, long ago, when I was trying to break in, one of the things that we did was go to the Nebula w Awards because there was often mingling beforehand with lots of agents and editors. So I went to that one time, and I was there, and they gave um, an award to the author of uh, Flowers for Algernon. Mm. Uh, Keys, I think is his name. Um, Daniel Keyes, maybe. Uh, I'm getting that, getting that wrong. It's, uh, it's an excellent story. But even ever since that, they gave him the award called Author Emeritus. Um, like it was like a lifetime achievement award. But they have a big deal lifetime achievement award called the Grand Master Award, mm. right? And he didn't get that. He got the other one, which was kind of the award that I read it kind of being as you wrote one really cool thing once. Here okay. is your award for writing this one really cool thing that has legitimately had a deep impact on the genre and things like that. And I've always wondered, what does it feel like to be the person that gets the award for the thing you wrote 40 years ago that's like, yep, this thing is still great. Here you go. Um, I think most authors would be happy that people are still reading of something of Probably. theirs 40 years later. Um, I remember getting asked when I was working on The Wheel of Time, someone came up to me and said, aren't you worried that you will, your whole career will be a footnote to the Wheel of Time? Mm. And I said, am I, I'm in the encyclopedia? <laughs> I'm in the footnotes? You know, yeah. like, m yeah. Most authors, as we've talked about, never even get read. So right. to be read well enough to make a footnote in the encyclopedia of, you know, For sure. whatever that would be, then. Yeah, most of us won't write one important thing. Mm-hmm. Well, now I'm depressed. Mm. <laughs> Maybe Sorry. you will, Adam. <laughs> if you keep your writing going. If I keep How's going, your writing going? It's going, it was going well. Now I'm uh -huh. trying to beat the weather for a house project that's outside. Oh, so that's I, right. It's been a couple of weeks of not much writing. I didn't mm. know you were a writer, Adam. Uh, well, yes. Uh, He's a good one. Uh, yeah, we'll stick with that. <laughs> <laughs> I have never read any of his writing. Oh, uh, Is that because he won't let you? Not allowed. That would be a nightmare for yes. me. 
Not do you allowed. let anyone read your writing or just not? Groups. Okay. Okay. There's like uh, a, a, I force them. a writing group of among the staff. At the oh, company. okay. Cool. Um, is everybody in it in on the staff? Not everybody. Okay. That would be a lot of people now, wouldn't it? No, no, no. <laughs> um, not everyone on the staff being on everyone in it on the staff. Oh, yeah, I understand correct. what right. you're saying now. Okay. Um, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Right. yeah that was, <laughs> I was like, you got a lot of people yeah, here now. Yeah, yeah we've, got, we've got 20 <laughs> something. That would be a big writing group. You need, by the way, mm. a company directory. Yeah, we do. You need a company directory that you can hand to people who might need to know who to contact so that's that they the know who to contact. Oh, good. Uh, good. Yeah, we're, yes. We are aware of this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we definitely. That in a Dragon Steel website so people can. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Things. All right. Get, get, us, uh, get us a last uh, question here, Adam. Okay. Let's see. Um, this one we kind of already talked about. And uh -huh. You guys can have me ask another one if you want. Um, but question for you both. How does one decide how long their series should be? And I mm. thought this was uh, Skyward Flight specific, but they This is a good question that. because I've been thinking about this lately. And so um, I, I will say one thing that people don't think about enough with sequels that I've just kind of stumbled into that really helps me is breaking it up so that there is something new or interesting to do in every, every story. Um, and when I broke up the Stormlight Archive, it was like, hey, I've got these 10 characters. I'm going to tell a backstory to each of them in each of these 10 volumes. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, it becomes 10 books, and they are right. able to. But even in Mistborn, I'm like, hey, I have three magic systems. What if I just, I know I'm writing a trilogy. What if I delve into one of the magic systems in each of the books? And it really helped me as a writer to know, okay, here's the new thing I'm exploring in this book. Um, and it helped me from the get-go to have that structure to build off of. I don't know how to answer that question. So I'm going to take it from the indie side. So in indie publishing, if you are doing something that is working, you want to write more of that because then it will work even more because the challenge is getting people into a series. And once they're in the series, there's a certain point in my rom-com series that after you read this book, I know you will read every book mm -hmm. that because they sell exactly the same, all the books after that. Point. Right. Um, and so... The temptation is just to write forever if you're doing something well, but if it starts getting like to where you can't keep this going or it's not creatively interesting anymore, then you need to stop. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of considerations that go into that. Like, do you have more stories to tell? Do you, is there a natural ending for the character? Can, and, and then you don't have to kill the series, right? You can pick it up with a different character and continue the series without continuing that. Is there a word for that, like an arc? I don't yeah. know what... The thing is, we we call so many different things series, series. Yeah. when there's really lots of different styles of right. series. Um, and um, I always, on on panels, like when we talk about series, I think I did this at FanX on the panel that we may have recorded. I'm like, here's a different... There's lots of different types of series. What type do you write? And can you define yeah. what that series is? Mm -hmm. Because, yeah. Well, I think we are going to call it here. Uh, thank you guys all for your questions. Thank you for hanging out with us this evening while I sign. Uh, looks like I am done with Hero of Ages for now. Yep. 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 Uh, they're very enthusiastic about that. And I am on to Warbreaker. So, um, so, and there were Way of Kings leather bounds, but they are all gone. They are gone in a little bit of time. Mostly. They're yeah. Oh, can they? Is there still a listing? On, uh, yeah. There's still a listing? Oh, cool. We've got 120 left. Okay. Okay. And, then, um, and I need to, I'll need, I'll double check with the bindery on numbers. So there might be some added once I have verification from okay. the bindery, just how many we have left. So there's a couple, maybe a hundred Stormlight ones. Um, Dragonsteelbooks.com, right? That's yes. the new domain? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Everyone, please check out Sunreach if you haven't, and also all of Jancy's wonderful work. Uh, you can't go to her website because we crashed it. Right, but go you tomorrow. can go to her Amazon page. <laughs> yes, look um, me up on Amazon. And They're so, all there. And uh, we will probably be back another time with a with Jancy in the future. I would guess. Thank you guys so much. Take care.